This week, we're looking at the Raspberry Pi 4 with 8GB RAM, but we're going to do something a little different as we install it in the super sleek, super spicy desktop case, the Argon One. Becca's got your top news stories, including a vulnerability in Intel processors that's been patched in Linux, the look of the upcoming PS5 gaming console, and the unbelievable new Pine Tab 10.1 inch HD tablet from Pine64. Finally, cryptocurrency is finding its way to the banks, and our crypto correspondent Robert Koenig will tell us all about JP Morgan's surprising change of heart as they begin accepting cryptocurrency. And the Bank of Korea is seriously interested in digital currency. This is all coming up, so strap in, it's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. My name is Robbie Ferguson. It's so great to be here with you in Studio E. And I've got to give a big shout out, a huge thanks, because this studio, this show, is able to broadcast thanks to BP9, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Ameridroid, Bill Marshall, and so many of you who have chosen to support Category 5 Technology TV, whether it be through our recent Kickstarter campaign or donating to ensure that Category 5 made it safely into this studio space. We do have those monthly expenses, and it's astonishing how quickly a month is over. And here we are. I can't believe it's now mid-June. So become a patron, folks. It is a great way to support Category 5 TV, if you love it. I mean, we give away this show for free, and we always will. And so I don't want you to ever feel like there's a cost involved in it. But there are costs involved, believe it or not. And, uh, and it's up to our community coming together to help us to afford to be able to do this. And I thank everyone who has helped us to be in this space. And I love being here. I miss my crew. I miss having Jeff and Sasha and Henry join me in our studio. I really do. Uh, but that time is coming. And in the meantime, I hope you're enjoying the content that I'm bringing you. Um, and that Beck is bringing you in the newsroom, and that uh, Robert is bringing you with the Crypto Corner, we're all doing our best, and we're working on ways to be able to broadcast the show as well as we can in this time. And things are changing. We'll see how things shape up over the next few weeks, couple of months. None of us really know what the timing looks like and what the space will look like at that point, but we're doing everything we can, and I, I'm so committed to bringing you new, exciting content every single week, and I hope you're loving it. Before I jump into the show this week, I want you to make sure that you subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. That's a way you can support us without spending any money. You can click that bell, and you're going to receive notifications whenever we're live or when I post new, exciting content. Keep in mind, we hit 25,000 subscribers on Linux Tech Show this week, and as promised, I am honor-bound to do a fancy dance number for you. I am so very sorry. <laughs> I've got my first choreography session this coming Saturday, so I hope I don't hurt myself. Wish me luck. And keep those subs coming, okay? It's linuxtechshow.com if you've never subscribed yet. Um, and who knows what will happen at 50,000 subscribers. All right, it's time to get into it, folks. And you know what happens when I do Maker Tech. It's time to steampunk it out. Let's do this. Because here's the thing you got to keep in mind. The Raspberry Pi 4 is now available in models with two four, or even 
8 gigabytes of RAM. It supports decoding H.265 video up to 4K60 plus H.264 Full HD. It has dual HDMI output, multiple USB 3.0 and 2.0 ports, gigabit ethernet, 802.11ac wireless supporting both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequencies, Bluetooth 5.0, and in case you didn't catch it, I already mentioned it, but it now has up to 8 gigabytes of DDR4-3200 RAM. 8 gigabytes in an SBC, folks. What? As the Raspberry Pi 4 is going to be in production until at least 2026, it's a great time to get into single board computers, my friends. Uh, or if you've already got a Raspberry Pi set up, it's time to upgrade. The specs of this particular Raspberry Pi are in line with a budget PC. So we want to look at it and make it look like a sleek, modern desktop device rather than just a piece of maker tech with a bunch of wires sticking out of the GPIO. And that, my friends, is where the Argon One case comes in. This stylish aluminum alloy body, the combination of both passive and active cooling, it has both. It's got a power button that safely controls the power state of your Raspberry Pi 4, and um, that's just a few of the points that make the Argon One case a beautiful choice. Shall we get into it? Let's get our maker on, folks. All right. First of all, I've got the Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigabytes of RAM. Does It, it looks like there's no tape on this box. This, these are the kind of boxes I like. There we are. All right. It doesn't even have a... Uh, that's crazy. Doesn't even have a uh, anti-static bag. So let's hope it didn't encounter any static along the way. What else have we got in the box? Nothing. Uh, a thing that says, hey, don't touch that. And a, a manual. All right. We've all seen a Raspberry Pi 4. We all know what they look like. There it is, folks. It has the micro HDMI. It's got the USB-C power input. It's got the headphone combination jack. It's got USB 2, USB 3, gigabit Ethernet, 40-pin GPIO, power over Ethernet um, connector, so you can buy an extra hat. It's got a camera uh, connector. It's got video connector. Um, and it's got the SOC, Wi-Fi chip, everything else. So we're familiar with that. I don't need to get into too many details. The Argon One Pi 4 case, however, and I should mention they do sell a Pi 3 compatible Argon 1, so keep that in mind. However, you can't intermix. So if you're using a uh, Pi 4, you have to get the Pi 4 model. If you're using a Pi 3, make sure you get the Pi 3 model. In our case, we're going bigger going home, folks. So let's get into it with the Pi 4 8 gigabyte. Never been opened before. Here we go. Let's see what is in this box. Paper. What is it? Uh, warranty card. Whatever. Uh, what's this? Instructions on how to do. You don't need these. You're watching the video and presumably I'm going to do a great job. Let's get into the bag. Ah, there it is. Who cleans up this studio space anyways? There's like weeks and weeks worth... <laughs> no, I'm so kidding. <laughs> All right, there's a protective film on the plastic bits. And this, my friends, that is the Argon One Raspberry Pi model. For, sorry, Raspberry Pi 4. Let's open it up and see what's inside. Okay, we've got... This expansion board. There it is. This is cool. So one of the things with a Raspberry Pi, or any single board computer for the most part, 
is that you've got these connectors all around the board, so it's really hard to make it look nice on a shelf. You've got the Ethernet coming out one side, you've got HDMI coming out the other, and power coming out here, and video coming out here, and, Jeep, and all that kind of stuff. So what they've done is they've provided a basically an adapter that is going to simply plug into the board, to the headphone jack, and the dual HDMI output. And what does it do? It puts all of those jacks directly onto the back of the Raspberry Pi. So I'm just giving that a nice snug little push. I'm being careful. I'm actually holding the, um, the points on the board that I'm pushing so I don't accidentally break that off, break the solder joints for that. I don't know that it would happen, but I want to be careful. So there you have it. So this is going to put the audio and the dual HDMI at the back along with USB, USB 3, and gigabit Ethernet. Further into the box, okay, we've got some thermal pads. We're going to need those to make thermal contact with the SOC and the, uh, the RAM. And here is the interior of the Argon One case for the Raspberry Pi 4. So we can see a, a fan controller with uh, GPIO, uh, GPIO riser pins. So the Raspberry Pi 4 is going to connect with the GPIO. So it's actually, um, this is really, really cool. If I can show you internally, so you're not losing the GPIO. What it actually does is under this magnetic hood here, if I can just get that off, there we go. It has the GPIO risen out from the board. So here's where the actual GPIO is, and it displaces it over here with a nice etched uh, GPIO header identifier. So you don't have to look for that card. How cool is that? So if you want to get into Maker Tech while this is looking so beautiful, you can easily remove this magnetic cover and access the GPIO. All right, so let's get this thing assembled and put together so we can fire it up. Now I mentioned that this is both active and passive cooling. So keep in mind, while this is a plastic base for the, uh, for the Argon One, this is an aluminum cover, okay? So this is for heat dissipation. The aluminum actually kind of pulls the heat away from the SOC. And um, these are the two contacts. So we've got one for the, uh, the SOC itself and one for the RAM. And then we've got the active cooler. So if it still gets too hot, um, even though it is dissipating the heat through the aluminum, then the fan, which is on a fan controller, will spin up to designated speeds that you specify based on temperatures. I'm going to show you how all that works in just a few moments. So I need this thermal pad, which is going to make a nice little contact with, um, with the S. Oh, these are not the thermal pads. These are feet. Whoa. I was like, hey, thermal pad. These are feet for the case. This is going to go right on here. Cool. I can do that first, can't I? We'll do things out of order. I'm sure that that's what the instructions say to do. Put the feet on first, just like Robbie at Category 5. That way I don't forget or lose them. How many people have a whole bunch of these rubberized feet sitting in their tool chest? There we go. Okay, that's done. Now I can put those aside. And now I do have these thermal pads, which there we are. They have like a, an adhesive on either side. So just peel off that plastic. Make sure you do. You don't want to put the plastic on there and have it melt on you. When you're doing a TV show, it's good to clip your nails for aesthetics. It's terrible for peeling plastic off the back of an adhesive. There. And that just goes right on there. Same with this one. There we are. And it's really, really easy to put together. It already is kind of pre-assembled. Boy, oh boy. 
If you have a choice, do not clip your nails before doing this. There we are. Didn't take any trouble at all. Isn't it great that the most challenging thing about installing this and doing this yourself to set up a Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigs of RAM and an Argon 1, the hardest thing was to get the sticky part, the sticker cover off of <laughs> the thermal pad. Okay, so observe the GPIO, the positioning of it, and we're going to position that directly over the GPIO here. Careful not to bend any pins. And I'm just going to turn this around so you can see this side as well. And I'm just going to push that down nice and snug. And it just goes in just like a GPIO should. There we are. Make sure everything is aligned nicely. And we've got all these screws. I presume it's time to put them all together. So it looks like I've got one, two, three, four spots to screw in internally and then four for the cover. So it's going to be these smaller screws on the inside. Note that there is a hole on the Raspberry Pi where there is no standoff, so you're not screwing into that, and we're leaving these four outer ones for the bottom of the case. So now I'm just going to put that on top and grab the four longer screws, and we're going to put those ones in. There we have it. Congratulations. You did it. You did it. It wasn't that hard, was it? Check out the ports on the back. I love how sleek that looks. Notice there's no other ports all around. We do have an SD, a micro SD port at the front, kind of hidden away on the bottom. However, all of the I.O. has been moved to the back. I love that. Plus, we've got this power button and it's just absolutely sleek. We do have to take a quick break. When we return, I'm going to fire this up and together we're going to check out the features of the Argon One case with the 8 gigabyte Raspberry Pi 4. Stick around. During the break, I grabbed my micro SD card with the latest version of Raspberry Pi OS on it. I wanted to say Raspbian, but they've changed the name, so it's called Raspberry Pi OS now. Uh, I tracked down my 5 volt, 3.5 amp power supply, and just keep in mind, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a power hungry beast. So while I could probably power it with my 3 amp power supply, or potentially even something a little bit less, you could damage your SD card if there isn't enough power and that's surprisingly easy to do. Let's say I willy-nilly plug in a USB device that draws an amp or something from the USB port. Well, there you go. So I prefer to err on the side of caution, so using a 3.5 amp power supply is just playing it safe. That'll ensure that I get the best reliability out of my Raspberry Pi 4. All right, with all the cables connected, I'm gonna fire up the Raspberry Pi 4 with a single press on the power button on the Argon 1. And I can hear just a little spin of a fan. I don't even think you'll be able to hear that with our compressors and everything else, but it's just a slight, I can tell that the fan has turned on and it's off and I am booted into my distro. Man, that is great. Okay, one thing I'm just gonna mention right out the gate. It's running cool, feels good, powered up great. There's one thing that I think Argon One potentially misses the boat on, and that's that we're still using the micro HDMI. Okay, so I'm still having to use a micro HDMI to HDMI cable in order to plug this into my TV and into the capture devices so that you can see it at home. However, now while I feel like, hey, they, they missed the boat on that, they could have made it full HDMI. They've got room for it, they could have done that. And besides, they're in control of what they put on the case. 
However, as I move this around, it's not janky at all. There's no disconnection on the HDMI. And I don't know about you, but when I plug my Raspberry Pi board directly into an HDMI cable, just like I've done with the Argon One, if I move it ever so slightly, the screen goes green or it goes kind of digitally distorted or something. And so I've got to jiggle that cable again. And then if it ever gets moved, I lose that connectivity and it causes problems. Well, the Argon One seems like, even though it's still micro HDMI, which mm, it's, it's not the perfect connection for this kind of thing. Even though it is still micro HDMI, it is significantly more solid than the micro HDMI that's built into the Raspberry Pi. And I noticed that immediately. So I think you will appreciate that. As I mentioned, I'm using a uh, micro HDMI to HDMI cable. You can also use a micro HDMI to full-sized HDMI adapter if you like. And the Argon One case is definitely giving me a better connection to um, that HDMI output. All right, I got to plug in a keyboard. I've already plugged in my USB uh, wireless mouse. I've got my keyboard here. And I'm just going to plug that into the USB 2 because I'm going to save those USB 3s for something else. There we go. All right, so the first, oh, wow, a little bit of latency there. <laughs> The first thing that I want to consider is I want to, I mentioned that this is, um, that this is a smart power switch. So the power switch is programmable. The heat um, dissipation, the active heat um, cooler is actually um, programmable. And I'm starting to feel a little bit of warmth there. This is what's making me think of that cooling system. So you can see there's vents out the side, and this is doing a really good job of cooling the Raspberry Pi 4. However, it is starting to get warm, and I want that fan to come on if it starts to get a little bit too warm. So it has that passive cooling from the aluminum, and it has an active cooling system, the fan, that will turn on as needed. So let's get into our terminal, and I need to become root. So I'm just going to type sudo su dash, and there, boom, I am root. So <laughs> I am root. You see the instructions that say to go curl and then the URL https colon slash slash download dot argon 40 dot com slash argon and then it's one the number one dot sh and then um, uh, uh, <laughs> a pipe why can't I think of the word uh, bash okay so I want to break down that command for you okay what I'm actually doing is I'm telling it to use curl to download basically to the output this script from download.argon40.com slash argon1.sh. But instead of outputting it to my screen, which is what would happen if I removed the pipe bash, see that? That's the script. Uh, so the pipe bash says, let's actually run that script in bash. It's piping that output into bash. So if I wanted to take a different approach and say, oh, I want to control what this is actually doing, or I want to modify this installer or the scripts before I actually install it, well, let's take a different approach. So instead, I'm going to wget that, or I could have piped the curl. So I'm going to wget, oh, and it's kind of monkeyed with my terminal window there. I'm going to Control C so that you can see that a little better. W get. Oh, there we go. So W get is a, another download tool, but this one is going to actually save the file to argon1.sh. Now it's grabbing the file. I've got it. And all I have to do in order to edit that file is I can use nano, for example. So nano argon1.sh. It's going to bring it up into my favorite text editor. All right, so first thing that I see, and I should say that one of the nice things about doing it this way is that you can inspect the code. It's, uh, this is one of the things about open source and the way that Linux works is you can look through and see if there's anything that you want to change or whatever you want to do. But So first of all, I see a couple of functions just basically so that they can reuse some of the things like uh, creating a file, touching it and setting the permissions before uh, adding the uh, content. Um, check if a package is installed. It's going to 
allow them to see a response code of either NG, which is presumably not good, or OK uh, if the package is not found in dpkg-query, and that is going to be called further down using this loop, which grabs a package list like raspy-gpio, python-rpy.gpio, and so on and so forth. So basically, packages that are going to get installed with apt-get. So then it goes uh, through a loop here uh, in package list, and it goes through that loop, installing and approving the installation of each of those packages. But if any of the packages fail to install, responds with ng, then it's going to say, hey, there's something wrong. You're not connected to the internet, and it's going to die. If, however, it, uh, because there's no else, it's just going to resume if that doesn't happen. So then it's going to move on to here. So we've named the daemon argon1d. And uh, we've got a power button script going to be created in user slash bin slash argon1d dot pi. We've got a shutdown script in lib system D called argon1d argon dot uh, dash power off dot pi. And so on and so forth. So those are just the file names so that they can be reused. All right, these commands are enabling uh, I squared C and I guess do serial. That must be... Serial? <laughs> That's just my guess, okay? <laughs> uh, and then we're starting to write out the file. So if the daemon config file does not exist, let's create it. So we touch it. For some reason, they're not using their, um, their function here. Maybe that's a bug and we could fix it. It doesn't matter. It's doing exactly the same thing. It's just funny that it, uh, it is happening redundantly. They could have used the function. These are comments. And then at the bottom of the config file are the temperature to uh, fan speed ratios. So if it hits 55 degrees C, uh, it's going to set the fan speed to 10%. If it hits 60 degrees C, it's going to set the fan speed to 55. And 65 uh, degrees Celsius is going to set the fan speed to a full 100%. So hopefully we never hit that point. So those configuration items, of course, they can be changed here before you install it. Or, and that's just going to change the output of the daemon config file. Or, of course, you can edit that later. Or you can use the tool that they're going to give you in order to make those uh, changes yourself. Shutdown script. There we go. See, they're using argon create file now. Uh, and it, this is a Python script that it is creating, although it's running this in bash. It's, so what it's doing is it's using the bash command to output to the shutdown script. Uh, it's importing sys, smbus, raspberry pi gpio as gpio, and then it's checking the revision number of the raspberry pi and acting accordingly. Uh, moving down, power button script. This is going to be what happens when you push that power button. So again, a Python script, it's grabbing the bus, it's grabbing the gpio, OS, the time, uh, and that's not just the time, that's the, like the counter and the clock and everything else. Um, okay, what's happening here? So, checks the revision again and acts accordingly because it may be a little bit different response um, based on the revision of the board. So, it's checking the shutdown check. This is a function. So, it, when you push the button, it responds. So, when you push it, uh, when you... Okay, so it's incrementing something called pulse time. That's a an integer uh, string that, well, not an integer string, but an integer that's incrementing. And every time you push the button, it's kind of, it's counting that. So when you push it twice, uh, it's going to safely reboot the, um, the Raspberry Pi. Now note what's actually happening when you push that button twice um, is that it's running the OS system command reboot. So it's not doing a hard reboot. It's not cutting power and then powering it back on. No, it's actually running the reboot command that I would run in my bash prompt. So it's a safe reboot. Uh, it's going to automatically uh, sync your SSD. It's going to save your files and whatever else that it normally would do during a reboot command. You can also add your own stuff here if you wanted to. Like I could do something like, remember, this is, this is uh, even though we're typing this in bash, this is going to be a Python script. So you could put any Python here any Python, and then just make sure that you pipe that with, uh, not pipe, but um, direct that to dollar sign power button script. You could also um, edit that, um, that file at any time. You could edit that uh, power button script, which is, if you go back up, it's going to be saved uh, power button script. 
slash user slash bin slash argon one d dot pi. So you can edit that script and then you'll be able to change the what it does when you push the power button twice or when you hold it in for three seconds. And, uh, and you can make it react the way you want. Maybe you want it to send you an email or something like that. You can do that. Um, or you have something else like a, a APC UPS that you want to have safely turned off or something after a 30 second timer. I don't know. Maybe you've got a watchdog plugged into the GPIO. You can use that as well. Uh, okay, so if you um, push the button for, uh, if you long press for th uh, three seconds, it's going to run shutdown now dash H. So that's actually a safe shutdown command to power off your computer. So you're not just killing power like you would if you continued to hold in that button for five seconds, which is not a safe way to do it. That's like your last resort. Um, but this script is, as you can see, running those commands as you normally would safely. So you push that button and it triggers the GPIO and it's monitoring how long you press it or how many times you press it and then it reacts accordingly. So with a little Python knowledge, you could make that do whatever you want. If I push it three times, I want it to play my favorite song. That kind of stuff. Whatever you think. You can look through here. Lots of fun, eh? So I love that as uh, you know, people who like to uh, look under the hood, uh, we can do so. And then when we're done, say we've made some changes, we can control O, enter to write our changes, and then control X to exit. And now I just need to go chmod plus X argon1.sh and now I can run that by going dot slash argon1.sh just like that which is exactly the same as using curl the URL piping it into bash and I'm gonna run that here we go it's already got GPIO it's already got a couple of the things that argon1 is needing I squared C is already installed and active and ready to go. And we're done. Shortcuts created. Okay, what? It does, oh yeah, look at that. There are actually shortcuts on my desktop. All right, Argon 1 configuration. Let's run it. We're going to execute that in a terminal. All right, Argon 1 fan speed configuration tool. This will remove existing configurations. Press Y. All right. Uh, what do you want to do? Always on? Let's try it. Yeah, I hear it. Can you guys hear that? It's so quiet, even at on. That's pretty good. I'm pleased with that. However, because it is controlled by an I squared C controller, rather than just a, a, a GPIO pin, it's not just on or off. It's you're able to set the threshold. So that's where we can run that configuration script again and say adjust to temperature. So Let's bring that up on our screen a little bit. I'm having trouble seeing that on my screen. Da, da, da. There we go. Okay, so please provide fan speeds for the following temperatures. 55C. Uh, let's do 25% fan speed. 60C. Let's do 50% fan speed. 65C. All right, 90%. Okay, so now the fan just shut right off because it is using the passive cooling to keep that thing below 55, I think it was. So it's completely silent. If I start using my Raspberry Pi to death, it's going to um, spin up that fan. All right, so now that I've got that script installed, presumably if I push the power button, it's not gonna do anything, nothing. However, if I push it two times, what's it gonna do? And we're going to lose the screen here, but if it works, we know. And there it goes. And now, notice it's not killing the power. I don't know if you can see that, but it has actually done a safe reboot. That's fantastic. That is the Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gigabytes of RAM plus the Argon 1 case. Those are just fantastic products. I'm really, really pleased with this. I love that I can still access the GPIO without having to take apart the case. That's cool. Just absolutely gorgeous. We've got to head over to the newsroom, folks. I hope you enjoyed that segment. Uh, we've got some great news stories for you, so here is Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The latest Intel crosstalk vulnerability has been patched in Debian, CentOS, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Sony has unveiled the look of the PS5. 
Facebook's Jiffy takeover is being halted while the UK Competition and Markets Authority investigate the deal. Researchers have discovered a way to record audio in real time by focusing a telescope on a distant light bulb. And the PineTab Linux tablet from Pine64 is now available for pre-order and you can get one for just $100. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. The latest Intel crosstalk vulnerability is now patched in Debian GNU Linux, Cent OS Linux, as well as Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. The recently found hardware vulnerability known as crosstalk was discovered by researchers from VUE University Amsterdam in some Intel processors. The flaw could allow local attackers or virtual machine guests to expose sensitive information like cryptographic keys from other users or VMs. Already patched in all supported Ubuntu releases, the vulnerability has also now been patched in Debian Buster and Stretch, plus CentOS 6 and 7, as well as Red Hat Enterprise Linux versions 6 and 7. To mitigate the vulnerability in their systems, users will have to install the latest Linux kernel and Intel microcode updates, which are now available in the stable software repositories of their distributions, although Debian Stretch users must enable the non-free repository to get the patch. Make sure you reboot your systems after installing the new Linux kernel and Intel microcode updates. Sony has given gamers a first look at the design of its next console, as well as some of the titles it will play. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, Sony opted to stream a pre-recorded video rather than host a live event. The PlayStation 5 has a black core surrounded by curved white edging and a blue glow. Two follow-ups to best-selling PS4 releases were among the standout game's announcements. Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Horizon Forbidden West. Sony's machine will launch alongside Microsoft's rival Xbox Series X before the end of the year. So many people remarked that the console looked like a Wi-Fi router that the term trended on Twitter shortly after the event. More than two dozen new games were shown off in total. Other highlights included a first look at Sony's racing game, Gran Turismo 7, and a brief look at Capcom, Capcom's zombie horror game, Resident Evil 8. The PlayStation 5 is set to go on sale later this year, seven years after the PS4. In addition to being able to deliver improved visuals, the new machine also has a customized hard drive that will make it possible to radically reduce load times. Sony is building a library of launch titles that will only be available on its next generation machine, including some brand new titles never before seen. One of the more unusual games was Stray, a third-person cat adventure that's set in a neon-lit cyber city. There was no mention of any virtual reality games, however, nor was there any mention of a PlayStation 5 version of The Last of Us 2. Rather than a quantum leap, this next generation looks like it might be built around lots of smaller improvements in areas like audio with 3D sound and improved haptic feedback in the controller. Beyond better visuals and faster loading times, what does the next generation actually mean when it comes to games? On this evidence, more of the same. Shooters, racers, third-person adventure titles, and sports games. Things we already have, but graphically improved. Facebook's takeover of Jiffy, a search engine for funny reaction images, is being investigated by the UK's Competition Authority. Jiffy's vast library of looping short video animations is hugely popular in Facebook's apps. But it also provides animations to competitors like TikTok, Snapchat, 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 and Twitter. Now, the UK Competition and Markets Authority, CMA, is investigating whether the purchase is a problem. It has sent an enforcement order to Facebook, effectively putting a hold on any merging of the companies until its investigation is over. Announcing the acquisition in May this year, Facebook said that half of Jiffy's traffic comes from Facebook apps, including WhatsApp and Instagram. But it also said that the deal, worth a reported $400 million, would not affect deals in place with other partners. 
The CMA, however, said it was investigating whether or not the acquisition may be expected to result in a substantial lessening of competition. But the enforcement means Facebook has to keep the Jiffy company, staff, and technology separate from Facebook itself, unless it gets advanced written permission from the CMA. It is not the first time concerns have been raised about the Facebook Jiffy deal with questions raised over the level of access Facebook would have to its competitors' data through the service. The CMA is inviting comments until July 3rd, with no date set for its decision. Researchers have discovered a way to record audio in real time by focusing a telescope on a distant light bulb, and the PineTab Linux tablet from Pine64 is now available for pre-order. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert's here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the Crypto Corner. And as usual, we'll start with the market. The market hasn't changed significantly in uh, the total volume, 270 billion. It was similar to last week, but there has been a dip uh, in the last few days and the market hasn't recovered since then. Although, as you can see, uh, last 24 hours, uh, most of the coins are in, uh, in green. So Bitcoin is now at 9,454 US dollars. And if we sort by seven days, <clears throat> we'll see that a few coins had a fa some fantastic gains. I mean, we've got Verge with 77.5% gain, and in total there are 15 tokens, coins, that had a gain over 15%. And if we saw it by downs, by negative, we only had two coins uh, that had um, uh, down trend, downwards trend over 15%. It shows that the market is uh, maturing and, and growing, as uh, it was also last week. If we look at my favorite subject, um, decentralized finance, the DeFi market, this one has grown by almost 1 billion in one week. It was last week 2.4 billion, now it's 3.3 billion. Uh, the biggest one is now Compound. As you remember from last week and the previous weeks, with MakerDAO as the number one, and that has changed now, and by a significant difference, it's now Compound being the number one with a growth in 24 hours of over 40%. So this market is heating up and it's getting more and more interesting from uh, day to day. Now another subject is, uh, and this, this is interesting for everybody here, because you hear so many opinions on how the market is performing. It's going up, it's going down, the future is going bright, it's d dark. And I just want to show you one example of what has happened in the past. <clears throat> and it is here, um, JP Morgan, their CEO, Jamie Dimon, said this was um, in 2017. He said that Bitcoin is a fraud and that every, he would fire everybody. And he said that openly in a, in a forum. Uh, every, he would fire every, everyone in the bank that is trading uh, Bitcoin in a second. Now, interesting enough, if we look into the news from this week, we see that JP Morgan completely surpri surprises with a bet, uh, Bitcoin flip. So now they're not supporting Bitcoin. And that's the interesting part. You need to really form your own opinion uh, in this market. Don't listen to so-called experts because you see JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, suddenly changes the opinion uh, overnight. Uh, and and um, so they're no real experts. You're the own expert. Just form your own opinion when you follow a coin or you want to do an investment. Next one is uh, an analysis on the, on the development of some coins. <clears throat> it's Outlier Ventures that did an analysis and uh, which was quite interesting. So they see that there has been a downturn in development for around 20% in average. But there are some, again, as Polkadot has got uh, an increased and substantial rise in developer activity. Uh, Polkadot and Cosmos 15% and Theta and Cardano uh, increased the core development uh, significantly. Uh, it's interesting because they did a very thorough analysis on, on uh, how the market is currently developing from the technological point of view, the development and so on. I will put a link of this PDF file in the in the in the in the description. Uh, 
Next headline is, you remember China, they have launched already their um, uh, cryptocurrency, their fiat crypt uh, cryptocurrency in our Korea. Uh, is doing the same thing. They're, they're playing this year. So everybody, every, every uh, country is suddenly jumping on this train of having a cryptocurrency-backed um, system. Next one is um, an analysis. Last week I reported about PwC uh, analysis on the hedge fund uh, uh, industry. And here this one was done by... Um, Fidelity Digital Assets, and they've got some interesting uh, findings too. So a survey of 800 in institutional investors in the US and Europe found almost 80% are intrigued by digital assets, with 36% already invested in the market. And broken up down by market, it looks like Europe it seems to be more bullish than the US because only 27% of the institutions of the U.S. institutions. Now, that includes pension funds, family offices, investment advisors, and digital and traditional hedge funds have invested in cryptocurrencies. But this is up from 22% a year ago, so it went up by 5%. Um, it's an interesting uh, development, I would say. Uh, and it shows that the investors in, in the investment market is participating in our industry. And last but not least um, is, and I'll put also a link of that report uh, in, the, in the show notes. Last one is the Human Rights Foundation launched a Bitcoin development fund. And uh, so the HRF launches a fund to support developers who are making the Bitcoin more private and decentralized and resilient so that it can, be better, uh, that it can better serve as a financial tool for human rights activists. I find it also interesting that uh, Human Rights Foundation is supporting with cash developers to make our Bitcoin a little bit more private. So that's it for me this week. I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to see you next week with some, I guarantee you, fantastic news. And um, yeah, until then, I wish you a great uh, week, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but simply sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever-changing and always volatile, so you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now, back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. In an era of digital eavesdropping where hackers employ a variety of means to take over built-in video cameras, peruse personal digital data, and snoop on cellular conversations, researchers have seen the light, literally. Viewers in the UK will want to make sure their license is up to date because here's an upgrade the BBC might want to add to their TV detector vans. Israeli researchers report that they successfully tapped into speech and music inside an apartment simply by focusing on a light bulb. In a paper published over the weekend, the researchers said all they needed were a telescope and a $400 optical sensor, which they used to measure barely perceptible light bulb vibrations triggered by either voices or music in the room. The research team conducted the test by pointing a telescope towards a light bulb in an apartment building 27 yards away. Capturing the vibrations from the bulb, they were able to reconstruct with fair quality Let It Be by The Beatles, Clocks by Coldplay, and a snippet of a speech by President Trump. The researchers said, We show how fluctuations in the air pressure on the surface of the hanging bulb in response to sound which caused the bulb to vibrate very slightly, a milli-degree vibration, can be exploited by eavesdroppers to recover speech and singing passively, externally, and in real time. They noted that a direct line of sight to the bulb is required. Lampshades or window curtains will prevent it from working. Also, the test sounds were played at maximum volume. The approach, called lamp phone, is an improvement over recent developments in eavesdropping technology. Ben Nassi, a developer of the program, explained, Any sound in the room can be recovered from the room with no requirement to hack anything and no device in the room. You just need line of sight to, ha to a hanging bulb, and this is it. Previous comparable approaches include the memorable 2014 visual microphone developed by MIT, 
Microsoft and Adobe that reconstructed speech and music from a room by analyzing micro vibrations from a bag of potato chips sitting on a table. While impressive, the device required massive computational power and much time to analyze recorded vibrations. Lamp phone can be conducted in real time. The wait is finally over as the Pine Tab pre-orders are now open for everyone. Powered by the latest Ubuntu Touch OS from UB Ports, the Pine Tab features a beautiful 10.1 inch HD IPS capacitive touch screen at 1280 by 800 pixels and is powered by an all winner A64 chip combined with a 64 bit quad core 1.2 gigahertz ARM Cortex A53 processor and a Mali 400 GPU. It comes with a replaceable 64GB eMMC module, 2GB RAM, and a micro SD card slot supporting up to 2TB cards. The Pine Tab also features a rear 5 megapixel camera with LED flash and a selfie 2 megapixel camera. It has stereo speakers, a detachable backlit keyboard option that can also act as a cover or a stand, and a removable battery. For, for connectivity, it has the usual suspects, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on, but it also has a headphone jack plus USB ports, including OTG and video HD output, which really helps the Pine Tab stand out at this price point. You can get your hands on the latest Linux tablet from Pine64 right now for only $99.99 USD or $119.98 USD with the detachable backlit keyboard. According to Pine64, the estimated shipping time is currently set for late July. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Oh, it has been so great having you here again this week. Please check out our website. It's category5.tv. There's some great content there, and you'll be able to watch videos from years gone by. We've been doing this for 13 years, and if you enjoy the content, please subscribe to us on YouTube at linuxtechshow.com. In the meantime, we are on Twitter at Category5TV. I'm personally on Twitter as your host, at Robbie Ferguson, and incidentally, I follow back. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform. We are on the Roku Channel Store, for example. You'll find us on YouTube. You'll find us on Facebook and Twitter. And all these places, just do a quick search for Category 5 Technology TV. And I thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful week, everyone. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.